Va bene, thank you uh, everybody. I would like to thank the organizers very much, Andrea, Michael, and uh, Stefano for uh, the invitation. And uh, so actually, me and Leo will talk about different things. I will start with a common uh, work, then Leo will, do, uh, will say something else. So, um, okay, this is a work mainly, um, this is the laser, Andrea. Uh, yes. Uh, mainly done by, so I will present mainly the results uh, uh, by me, Fausto Borgonovi and Lea Santos, but uh, this work, uh, uh, we are going, let's say, working on this topic also with Robin Kaiser and Romain Bachelard. So, uh, as we have seen in this conference, long-range interacting system has very many peculiar uh, features, like broken ergodicity, long-lasting out of equilibrium regimes, ensemble and equivalence, quasi-stationary state, and the shielding effect that we're talking this uh, here now uh, is not completely unrelated by all these features. Uh, so recently there has been a huge surge of interest in long-range interacting system on the nanoscale and condensed matter fit systems, uh, and this is not trivial. I mean, it was not uh, like that once upon a time. On one side, indeed, engineered uh, nanoscopic systems where long range is important can be devised, and as we have seen from uh, the talk of Ross, the, long, the range of the interaction can be even tuned in ion trap experiments, for instance. On the other side, uh, as I will briefly show afterwards, long range is present even in natural systems like photosynthetic complexes. So why long range is important uh, is not only because it's there, but uh, is deeply connected with cooperativity and emergence of quantum properties like superconductivity, superradiance, uh, macroscopic quantum tunneling, just to make a few examples. And these properties, cooperative properties, can be very important for functionality and they are robust to noise. So they can be used to devise, uh, to build devices uh, robust at room temperature. So uh, briefly, these are two systems uh, we are working on. We, I will not focus on this system in this talk, but just I would like to mention that in both systems, this is a cold atomic cloud in Robin Kaiser experiment. We have one of our interactions, so long range interaction between the two level systems, the rubidium atoms in the cloud. And this is a natural system. These are even between chlorophylla molecules. We have uh, a dipole interaction and even a distant independent interaction since. Uh, uh, this system has been mentioned. This is another example of natural system where long range is important that I wanted to mention to you. Uh, in both cases, long range is deeply connected with cooperativity, uh, and it induces super and subradiance, for instance, in both systems. And these effects are robust to noise, and so are very important for the functionality, uh, for instance, of photosynthetic systems. Okay, but the, the reason why uh, the topic, the specific topic I want to talk about is the role in long range in the spreading of perturbations. So uh, what, what we mean by spreading of perturbations, say, let's say you have a system and you quench, you perturb locally one part of it. Then you might ask yourself, how long does it take for this perturbation, for the information of this perturbation to reach the whole system, right? And this question is, 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 is interesting and it's important. For instance, it's, connecting, it's connected in quantum computation. Say you want to you create a locally entanglement. You want to know how fast entanglement will spread all over the system. And of course, the spreading of perturbation is also related to the thermalization of a system. So to know how fast information can spread in a system is important from many different uh, reasons. So uh, in short-range interacting system, Lee-Robinson theorem uh, states that the spreading of the perturbation is linear, its velocity is independent of the system size, and it's proportional to the short-range coupling. So this is called, uh, so it determines a sort of a non-relativistic light cone within which perturbation can spread through the system. And of course, this sets also the time scale of thermalization in short-range interacting systems. Uh, of course, the question that people ask themselves, uh, it, it was whether using long range we, qu we can break, we can violate Lee Robinson bounds and spread correlation much faster, which would be good. It would lead to maybe faster relaxation or uh, super fast spreading of entanglement. So uh, some theoretical work, for instance, in, the, in this PRL of Auk and Tagliacozzo, they consider a 1D chain 
where the, there is an external field along the z direction, this spin one half chain, and the long range interaction along the x with a tunable range of interaction alpha. Of course, uh, short range is for alpha less than one and long range is for alpha larger than one. So uh, they perturb the system. They start with all the spin down along the z direction. Then they flip the middle spin up and they see how fast this perturbation spreads. So what, you are, what these 2D plots are the, the, the average z component of each spin. So you see that in time, this is time, the perturbation spreads within a linear light cone. Yes, please. J is uh, positive here. Negative, sorry, negative. They're both negative. B and J are negative, sorry. So, uh, so actually, uh, yes, yes, they're both, yes, they're negative. Uh, so you see that the perturbation for alpha free, which is short range, spreads linearly within this kind of light cone, okay, according to the Lee Robinson theorem. On the other side, as you decrease uh, alpha and you go in the long range uh, side, you see that the spreading of uh, uh, perturbation is almost instantaneous. It's very, very fast. And uh, Michael Kastner uh, did a lot of work to determine the velocity of the spread is in long range system, if you want to know more. Uh, so, um, Excuse me. yes. You, when you do cut rescaling, they didn't do cut rescaling here, but we will talk about this rescaling. I will show you results with the rescaling. And you do it on J, of course, because uh, this is the term which is uh, non-extensive. Non so uh, this model has been uh, realized even experimentally, as uh, again, Ross showed us yesterday, in ion trap experiments. And the range of interaction, again, can be tuned from zero, so all to all interaction, uh, to free, short range interaction. Again, what they did, they start with all spin down along the Z direction. They flip the middle spin up. You see, they, they interact with everybody, and they see how the perturbation spreads. And they confirmed experimentally that long range can break Lee Robinson bound, OK? At the same time, uh, uh, many theoretical results uh, have shown that the opposite can happen in long range interacting system. Actually, instead of a super fast spreading of the perturbation, you can have a suppression of the spreading of the perturbation. This is a figure from Michael Kastner work. This is the velocity of the spreading of perturbations. This is alpha, the long range. So as, as alpha decreases, so the interaction becomes more long range, the velocity decreases, you see. So this is an example of a contradictory features that people found in long range interacting system. So on one side, propagation of perturbation can be very fast. On the other side, can be very slow. And the shielding effect I want to show you today uh, actually can explain these contradictory uh, features. OK, good. So what is this very nice uh, cooperative shielding stuff I want to tell you about? So the point is this. Let's say we have an Hamiltonian described by H0 plus V, OK, where H0 contains external field and short range interaction, and V long range interaction. So I will show you that we can eliminate V from the dynamics in certain subspaces. So the propagation can occur as if long range is not present. And uh, uh, actually, in these subspaces, the propagation occurs determined by an effective short range Hamiltonian, which drives the perturbation propagation. So in long range system, you can have propagation within the Lee Robinson bounds as if it would be short ranged. Okay? Uh, and why, so it's, we call it shielding, because the propagation of perturbation occurs as if long range is not there. But this is it's true only for finite times. Longer times, long range will come back again to life, OK? But this time scale increases with the system size. That's why it's cooperative effect. So let me make a very simple examples how shielding can arise. So let us consider. So H0 plus V again, but now I make a trivial assumption. H0 and V commute. And let's say that V has a highly degenerate subspace. So of course, if our initial state belongs to a degenerate subspace of V, and V and H0 commute, the evolution, V only gives a global phase to the, to the evolution, so to the dynamics. So the dynamics is determined only by H0. So in, in this trivial example, H0 is our emergent Hamiltonian, which drives the dynamics, if we start from, from and against the spaces of V. And uh, V is shielded. Okay, This is a, a trivial case where you can talk about shielding. 
Of course, again, you can see that you can have very different behavior. If your initial state is in a superposition of two against the spaces of V, then V, of course, will, will be very important. So you can have both a dynamics determined by V in this stupid example, or a dynamic shielded from V, according to which subspace you start with. What I, I will show you is that when, when V is long range, this kind of effect can occur even if V and H naught do not commute, and even if V is not degenerate, okay? So uh, I will start to, re to present the results of Mille and Fausto in the recent PRL, uh, and first we start simple. We start from a, a linear chain of spin one half uh, systems uh, with an external field along Z and a long range interaction along X, like they did in, experiment, in the experiments, okay? And, and uh, notice, in the experiments, again, they started with all the spin aligned in the Z direction, okay? And, they've, and they quenched it along the Z direction and they've seen super fast propagation. Here we will, we will choose another initial state condition to, to just to make an example for you. We will start along X and we will chain quench along X. Okay, so um, before uh, showing you the first results, let us discuss what is the spectrum, the structure of the spectrum of the long range interaction, which is very important to understand what's going on. So you see, um, for alpha zero, then it's very easy. We can exactly diagonalize the long range interaction part. The long range is just a function of the total magnetization along X squared. And so what are the, its eigenstates? These are the eigenstates of MX, basically. So all spin down will be the ground state along X. All spin down, but one spin up, one excitation. B counts the number of excitation. B1 is one excitation. This is the first excited manifold, second excited manifold, and so on. So you have many uh, manifold characterized by the number of excitation along X. And these are highly degenerate, exponentially degenerate. And uh, there are gaps between the, the, these subspaces, which increase with the system size. When alpha is larger than zero, but less than one, you still have, let's say, uh, um, bands. But uh, these bands are not degenerate anymore. Now the degeneracy is broken, so the, 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 each band is not degenerate. So the against subspaces are not degenerate, and uh, for, at slow energy, B is still a good quantum number. While for alpha larger than one, the bands mix, there is no energy gap anymore, okay? So first, uh, first feature of a long range is this clustering of eigenvalors around uh, uh, bands. Okay, let's see immediately uh, a spreading of perturbation in, in this model. So we have an external field and a long range interaction along X. We start with all spin down along X, the middle up. This is for alpha free, so short range, and you see as expected, the linear propagation of perturbation, which, is, which depends on the range of the interaction, the coupling strength of the interaction, okay? Now, as you decrease the increase the interaction range, so you send alpha to zero, for instance, you might naively expect that the propagation gets faster, but here you see exactly the opposite, right? The propagation gets frozen for a very long time. And, and uh, this is true also for alpha zero, not only for alpha zero, uh, it gets frozen for a shorter time, but it gets frozen for, for a very long time as well, okay? So this is, this is a, simple, a simple case I wanted to show you. Maybe rather uh, counterintuitive, it's very easy to explain as I will show you in the next slide. So we increase the interaction range and the propagate spreading decreases, okay? So how can you can explain it? Let's start from alpha zero. So these are the bands of V for alpha zero, the degenerate bands all spin down, one up, et cetera. The external field is a field along Z. It can be written as a rising and lowering operator along X. So this field, what it does, is tries to mix the bands. It connects nearest neighbor's bands because it changes the excitation by one. Now, as we increase the system size, uh, this distance increases, but also the number of connections between the bands increases. But at the end, let's say it wins, the energy gap wins, and the probability to leak out the against the spaces of V as you increase the system size goes to zero. So basically, you get stuck in an, if you start from an against the spaces of V, you get stuck there when alpha is zero. If you get stuck there, uh, B does not connect the states inside of it, and so the dynamics, the propagation is given by an effective Hamiltonian, which is just zero in this case, okay? 
For alpha different from zero, it's also easy to understand what happens. Because still there are bands. B is a good quantum number, the number of excitations. B connects different bands. Even if the bands are not degenerate, uh, the external field does not connect states inside the band. So again, the energy gap increases with the system size for alpha long range. And this suppresses uh, connection between different bands. And so you also get stuck in, in the against the spaces of V and effective evolution is zero up to a certain time, which we computed, but I don't want to enter in this detail now. Okay, this was a simple case, easy to understand. It, it happens anyway, I will show you at the end. It happens anyway. Indeed, so uh, this is a, an important uh, point, actually. So now I'm giving you an explanation in terms of energy bands. I will show you that even if this proves what happens here, this is not necessary, okay? This will be the, the last point. So it's, it, 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 I, I'm using it to explain you rigorously what is happening here, but it is, it is sufficient but not necessary for this effect to happen, okay? Okay, now we complexify the system. On the top of long-range interaction, we add nearest neighbor coupling along Z, okay? What is the role of the... Uh, let's see what happens with nearest neighbor coupling now instead of external field. So here in the left column, I'm showing you the case alpha zero. Uh, so you see, uh, the, the spreading of the perturbation before was frozen. Now with nearest neighbor, we have a short range propagation of the perturbation. This propagation of the perturbation is independent of J, of the long range coupling strength. You see, we go from, we change J by four times from one half to two, and the velocity does not change. And actually, it is also independent of the range of the interaction. As we change alpha, the velocity does not change. So when we have a propagation of perturbation which is independent of the long-range coupling strength, and it depends only on the short-range coupling strength, if we change Jz, the, 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 cup, the nearest neighbor coupling strength, you will have a change in the perturbation, okay? So this is clearly show uh, why we talk about shielding. So we, we change J, the long-range coupling strength, and the uh, velocity uh, spreading of perturbation does not change. Now, let me focus on alpha zero, and then we discuss alpha different from zero. So let's explain what, what's going on with, for alpha zero. So the nearest neighbor coupling, ZZ, can be written as, you know, as every Z can be decomposed in rising and local wearing operators and long X. So uh, we can decompose this interaction is an excitation preserving part the blue one, which connects the states inside the band, which are characterized by a fixed number of excitation, and an excitation changing part, which changes the number of excitation by two. So it connects bands with the first by two, okay? Of course, as we increase the system size, the green part will be, will be killed. So you, you will remain in the against the spaces of V, but now the interaction will connect these states. The nearest neighbor interaction will connect the states within the band. And the effective Hamiltonian will drive the interaction, will be given by this excitation preserving part, which is a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. So that's why it is independent of the long range part, it's given only by this effective uh, short range part, which is the projection of the nearest neighbor part, is not exactly the nearest neighbor part, on the, uh, against the spaces of V. And it depends, of course, only on, the, on JZ. Uh, now we can write down. For the case alpha zero, the emerging long range Hamiltonian making the analogy with the quantum Zeno effect. You know, the quantum Zeno effect is the freezing due to frequent observations of dynamics in invariant spaces, okay? Uh, following Pascazio, we can make a model for a continuous measurement where the total Hamiltonian is described by H naught, which is our system, coupled with a coupling strength kappa to a measurement apparatus described by H measurement. As you increase kappa, the dynamics gets, and so the, the, the rate of measurement becomes more frequent. The dynamics get stuck in the against the spaces of each measurement, okay? In our case, the long range part plays the role of the measurement apparatus, so to say. But now we don't increase, you don't need to increase the interaction strength, even when you increase the, the, the size of the system. The long range part uh, becomes important, and the dynamics get stuck uh, in its against the spaces. And so the Zeno Hamiltonian, which is the projection of uh, the total Hamiltonian over the against the spaces of V, becomes exactly our effective Hamiltonian. 
So the defective short-range Hamiltonian which describes the propagation of the perturbation in our system, in, in the case alpha zero, so all-to-all -all interaction, is exactly the Zeno Hamiltonian if you map long range in a measurement apparatus system, okay? Indeed, we, we, we computed the fidelity, the Zeno fidelity, so we make the system, and now we don't start with, a, with a, a specific initial condition. We start from an ensemble of random initial condition, okay? And then uh, we, we make it evolve according to the full Hamiltonian, then we make it evolve according to the Zeno Hamiltonian, we compute the overlap, if the fidelity is one, the two evolution are close by. If the fidelity decreases, the two evolution gets far apart, okay? And here, here we change the, 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 the strength of the external field. Here we change the nearest neighbor strength. Black, red, and green curve are increasing n. So as you can see, as we increase the system size in this direction, the fidelity decays gets lower, and so the Zeno Hamiltonian becomes a better and better description of the system. And the Zeno Hamiltonian is either zero or contains nearest neighbor interaction. So I'm almost done. Uh, I so for alpha zero, then using the energy gaps, okay, we have proven that the dynamics can be described by a Zeno Hamiltonian, which is an emergent short range Hamiltonian, which is valid up to a time scale, which increases with the system size. And that's it for the cooperative shielding case. Now I want to, uh, you to think a little bit better uh, to the case alpha not zero, because there you have a hint that the energy gap is not so important. For alpha different from zero, we remain also constrained in a fixed number of excitation manifold. But this manifold now is not degenerate. So the interaction, the nearest neighbor interaction, connects different states, which now do not have the same value of the long range coupling. Okay, they are not against, degenerate against, the st against states of V. So you might wonder, why if I couple different states which have a different value of the long range interaction, nevertheless the propagation does not fill the long range interaction? So evidently, when, during the dynamics, you do not excite, you excite states which differ very, very little by the value of V. So even in the band, in the bands uh, with, uh, of V with long range, finite long range interaction, you get stuck in subspaces in which V changes very little. This is the only way we can explain that the propagation is short range. But uh, to convince you that the gap is not important, I will do even more. So now we'll show you some preliminary results we are having with Romain Bachelard. And here I'm considering classical systems. So nobody can doubt uh, that there are no gaps in the classical systems, okay? So we consider a many-body spin system with an external field along Z, the nearest neighbor interaction along X, and we also rescale the long-range interaction here. So we make everybody happy. Now there are no gaps, and the interaction is rescaled. So as we increase the system size, this term and this term, they weight the same, okay? And now uh, the, we ask ourselves, okay, is shielding present also in this uh, totally different case, I would say, okay? And the answer uh, that we have uh, is yes, we have cooperative shielding. This is the spreading of perturbation in a classical system is independent. These two cones are for two different values of the long range interaction. You see, the propagation is linear, like in a short range system, is independent of the long range strength. Here j is one and here is two. So we double the j and it doesn't change the velocity. While if we change the nearest neighbor coupling, yeah, we increase it twice, and the velocity increase, decreases. Sorry, we decrease the nearest neighbor coupling, and the velocity decreases. So, even in classical system with no gaps and rescaled long-range interaction, the propagation is independent of the long range up to some time, and it depends only on the nearest neighbor coupling. Finally, here we change the number, the system size, and you see that here the shield, the linear cone goes up to above 10 and then it breaks, you see a signature of breaking of the linear propagation. And here, you see for 350 that it goes up to 150. So you, we increase the system size, now there are no gaps, the interaction is rescaled, but the time scale over which the propagation is described by an emergent short range dynamics increases with time. So again, it's cooperative and it's shielded. And uh, that's it, I'm done. Uh, the reason why I think it happens, 
uh, in, short, in, in classical systems and in general, I think uh, is to do with the mean field uh, description. So long range system, uh, long range uh, description, what, what, does, what, what does it mean long range? It means that they, the particle behave as if they are independent, right? Uh, mean field. So if you can make a mean field description that the particles do not interact, and, and if these uh, mean field manifolds are robust, you perturb them, and the propagation of perturbation occurs as if long range is, long range is very weak if mean field prevails, right? So here we add the short range interaction on the top of the long range. So mean field is very strong. Fluctuation around mean field are, are very weak and gets weaker as n increases. And so the short range interaction you add on the top of it prevails. So you have a huge collective motion which does not transmit perturbations. On the top of it, any short range remaining part is the leading part in these manifolds uh, determined by the mean field. That's, that's the idea we have now, and uh, thank you for your attention. All right. So um, I'll be talking, well, thank the organizers for this very interesting um, conference. I'll be talking here about the same quantum model that Luca just told you about, but uh, in the regime of uh, this limit of uh, infinite range interaction. And what we'll be looking at is what are the consequences to the static and dynamical properties of the systems when we reach uh, what is known as excited state quantum phase transitions. So quantum phase transitions that happen at high levels. And you'll see that these results are very much connected with some experiments in ion traps, Bose-Eyes and condensate, and NMR. So uh, the Hamiltonian that we are looking at is uh, this one, no? the one that was already realized in experiments with ion traps, as we heard yesterday in Rolls' talk. Uh, what is fascinating about this experiment is that they can tune the range of the interaction by varying alpha from three to something very close to zero. And in these experiments, as Luca already told you about, they were very interested in the dynamics, you know, how fast these systems can evolve in the presence of long range interaction. So the longer the interaction, the faster the dynamics. So they started with initial states such as this one, with all the spins pointing down in the z direction, all pointing down but one or two, which are eigenstates of the z part of the Hamiltonian. And then they let it evolve according to the whole Hamiltonian. I'll be doing pretty much the same thing, but now instead I'll be looking at alpha zero. So alpha zero is the case of infinite range interaction, all to all couplings, and as Odell, Odell already told us about, I can rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of the total spin in the z direction and the total spin in the x direction. So this is the famous Lipkin model. Then. So the Lipkin model has a ground state quantum phase transition when this control parameter C is 0.2. In this talk, I'm mostly interested in what happens above 0.2. And well, some details about this Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian has a U2 algebraic structure with two limiting dynamical symmetries, the U1, which is the Z part, and the SO2, which is the X part, the SX squared. Uh, I will focus on the U2 Hamiltonian, but just to let you know, these results are general. They are also valid to U3, U4. These are Hamiltonians used to describe the vibrational spectrum of molecules in 2D and 3D. Very well, so what are excited state quantum phase transitions? In a system where we have an excited state quantum phase transition, the ground state quantum phase transition, on the vanish between the gap and the first excited state, does not happen in isolation. It happens together with the clustering of the eigenvalues around the ground state. This is what I'm showing with this plot here. I'm showing the density of states, histogram of eigenvalues, and you see this peak around the ground state, right at that point of the ground state quantum phase transition. Okay, let's increase this control parameter. And what you see is that this peak moves to higher energies. And these peaks, uh, well, so this peak, this divergence in the density of states is what became known as excited state quantum phase transition. And the energy where this peak happens is the energy of the excited state quantum phase transition. Another way to see the same story is with this plot. So here I'm showing to you all of the eigenvalues for different values of the control parameter. And you see that above point two, we have this clustering of the eigenvalues around this dashed line. So this dashed line is the separatrix, is the line that marks the excited state quantum phase transition. There is an equation for this dashed line which is obtained in the semi-classical limit. So from the point of view of eigenvalues, this subject is very well understood. You know, the subject emerged in the context of nuclear physics. And in nuclear physics, in molecular physics, you have access to the spectrum. 
what we are asking here is what are the effects of the dynamics. No? So, uh, and this will allow us to make a connection with experiments where dynamics is frequently studied. So what are the effects of these transitions to the dynamics? Okay, before going straight to the dynamics, let me talk a little bit about the structure of the eigenstates. So here I have the eigenstates of the total Hamiltonian, and I'm writing it in this basis, which is the, the Z part of the Hamiltonian, the U1 basis. And I want to know how much is spread out, how much delocalized these states are. To do that, I'm going to compute this quantity known as participation ratio, which is one over the sum of these coefficients to the fourth. So you see if the state is very spread out, I have many, many tiny Cs, the participation ratio is large. If, I, if the state is localized, few Cs, so the participation ratio is small. Okay. So in each panel here, I'm showing the participation ratio for all of the eigenstates. Up to 0.2, nothing really special. What I have is just a small participation at the edges, localization at the edges. As I go above 0.2, you see this sudden dip. No? So this sudden dip happens right at the separatrix, right at the energy of the excited state quantum phase transition. So this sudden dip, this sudden localization of the eigenstates capture this transition. To understand better this localization, let's go and have a look at a single each individual eigenstate. Okay? So in each panel here, I have just one eigenstate. So I'm showing the components of the eigenstates versus the energy of those basis vectors. So this is a state below the separatrix. This is a state above the separatrix. Nothing really special. They are pretty delocalized. Of course, this one prefers basis vectors with lower energy, this one with higher energy. But this one is the state right at the separatrix, right at the energy of the excited state quantum phase transition. And you see it's highly localized in a single basis vector. And what is this basis vector? It's the one where all the states are pointing, all the spins are pointing down in the z direction. So this basis vector is the ground state of the z part of the Hamiltonian. So let me explain what is, what is going on here. Here I'm plotting the energies of all of the basis vectors versus the control parameter. Okay, so basis vectors, not the eigenstates. And that state, with all the spins pointing down in the z direction, is the one that has lowest energy up to 0.2. But as I go above 0.2, you see this state being carried up in energy, and it's following the separatrix. So now let me come back to the eigenstates. What do we have? The eigenstates that are below the separatrix, these are states that have structure closer to eigenstates of the SO2 part, you know, the X part of the Hamiltonian. Above the separatrix, the states have structure closer to the U1, the Z part of the Hamiltonian. So let me fix the control parameter and go up. Okay, so I'm going up in energy, SO2, SO2, SO2. I hit the separatrix. This is the beginning of the U1. So the eigenstate there is highly localized in the ground state of the U1. Now, this localization will, of course, have consequences for the dynamics. If I start with this initial state and let it evolve according to the Lipke model, even though this state may have very high energy, the dynamics will be, of course, very slow. So I'm going to look at the survival probability as a way to quantify the speed. It's just the probability for finding the initial state later in time. And what do you see is, of course, this state, this basis vector evolves much slower than the other ones. All right, survival probability may not be the best quantity to uh, uh, observe experimentally, so, of course, you could look, for example, at the total magnetization in the z direction. No? And you will see that this observable is evolving much slower for that state. Okay, so I talked about magnetization, so let me make a break and come back to static properties. This is uh, what I'm showing here is the total magnetization in z for all of the eigenstates. Remember the eigenstate right at the separatrix is the one very close, very localized to this basis vector. So the total magnetization in Z here drops. No? So the value of the total magnetization captures the transition very well. Natural question is what happens to the total magnetization in X, the total magnetization in the X direction. And there again, we can capture the presence of the excited state quantum phase transition. What you see here is a bifurcation, much connected with experiments. So before going into details about that, let me tell you about some of these experiments. There is a recent experiment done by the Florence group. What they have there was a bose eisen condensate in a double well and in the ground state, and a Hamiltonian equivalent to the one we are studying. 
And what they are looking at is this imbalance, you know, the difference in population between the left and the right well. And they are after the ground state quantum phase transition. Okay? So when the control parameter is below the critical point, that state is symmetric. So the population on the left and the right is the same. The imbalance is just zero. When they go above the critical point, then you have a very high population, either on the left or on the right. So you have this bifurcation. That's how they capture the, the, the ground state quantum phase transition. Let me come back to my language of spins. And uh, what they are calling balance there is our total magnetization in the x direction. They are talking about ground state, so let's focus on the ground state first. So here I am with my ground state. Up to point two, my ground state is closer to the U1. Symmetry is closer to the eigenstate where all the spins are pointing down in Z. So my total magnetization in X is just zero. As we cross the critical point, then my ground state becomes degenerate. Now I have um, eigenstates degenerate and uh, closer to the SO2 symmetry. Remember, SO2 is SX squared. So that means I have one state with positive magnetization and the other one with negative magnetization. So I have this um, bifurcation. Now, the bifurcation does not happen just for the ground state. It happens to all of the excited states. Um, once I cross the separatrix, I see pairs of degenerate states. This is what you're seeing here in black and white, so these degenerate states. And of course, this um, bifurcation happens also as a function of energy. So this is what I'm showing the next plot. Here, I fix the value of the control parameter, 0.6, okay, and I'm going up in energy. So all of the eigenstates below the separatrix, they are closer to the SO2 symmetry, so I have positive and negative magnetization X. As I go above the separatrix, closer to U1, and then we are zero. So now the bifurcation will also have consequences for the dynamics. This was already seen in some experiments, but they were mostly focusing on classical bifurcation and um, not making this connection with excited state quantum phase transition. But what are these two experiments? One is the one that Odell already mentioned to you, Obert Haller's group in um, Heidelberg. So the, again, they have their Bose-Eisen condensate with two internal modes. And um, the other experiment is done by the group in Rio, Oliveira's group. This is NMR, so they are thinking in terms of magnetization. Okay, so Vitalis is thinking in, in terms of imbalance and Oliveira in terms of magnetization. What they do, they prepare an initial state, let it evolve, and see how these dynamics depends on the parameter, which is the control parameter. So what do, the, what do we have? This is uh, the result from Obert Hala. Let me make the translation in my language of spins. So I'm start with an initial state, which is an eigenstate of the SO2 part. So I have all the spins pointing up or down in the X direction. And I'm looking at the total magnetization X, no? the imbalance for Obert, Obert Hala. When my control parameter is, is smaller than the critical point, I'm in this region. So I have oscillations around zero. When my control parameter is above the critical point, I'm in this region, so I'm trapped in one of these two branches, and you see this self-trapping. This self-trapping ha uh, happens as a function of the control parameter, but it happens also as a function of energy. If I start with an initial state here with low energy, you see the self-trapping. Okay. Anyway, so this was a very short talk. Uh, I just wanted to show to you that there are different ways to capture the presence of this excited state quantum phase transition. The special one is to capture it in terms of the dynamics. You saw here that we start with initial states that are accessible to experiments such as those in ion traps. Now, an important message of this talk, which was also an important message for Lucas talk, is that dynamics does not depend only on the Hamiltonian, of course. It depends also on the initial state. Now, the dynamics is not just because we have long-range interaction that the dynamics has to be super fast. It depends on the initial state that we picked. Now, so here I showed to you cases where the dynamics can be very slow or we can have self-trapping. And Luca showed to you the case of uh, cooperative shielding. So thank you for your attention.